Rejoice always. The, the next verse says, Give, pray continuously, constantly pray. Now, when the Bible says pray constantly, sometimes we understand this as in the morning when I get up, I'm supposed to have my quiet time. That is pray constantly. No, that's your quiet time. But after your quiet time, your non quiet time also you pray. When you're on the bus, you pray. When you're driving, you pray. When you're buying your potatoes and your tomatoes, you pray. When you're fighting with people and they're fighting with you or arguing, you pray. That's praying constantly. And that's a spiritual act. Now let me, let me explain to you. Prayer can be in two formats. One is a verbalized prayer. One is a spiritual prayer. The verbalized prayer is when you pray in a group, in a home group, in a Bible study, in the church. It's a verbalized community praying. It's corporate prayer. But you don't have to be verbalizing your prayer. Everywhere in public for people to understand who you are or for God to hear you. But the Bible also says pray in the spirit. But what does it mean when it says pray in the spirit? It says that you need to understand that prayer does not necessarily has to be verbal and loud. It, it's a spiritual act. So if you are in confrontation with an enemy or somebody is trying to do something to you. Even in your dialogue of that person. You can spiritually pray continuously. You will see the Lord deliver you. So prayer is not that, oh, right now I have to concentrate in arguing and fighting and win this battle. And I'll go back to my room and quietly and I'll pray for what I argue. No, you don't need to do that. When are you going to have time to go back to your room and pray about your argument or your fight? You might not even go back to your room. You might go to the hospital straight from there. You see, when we are, every day we are in battle, every day, we are in a warfare, we are on the battleground, you are not going to have a specific secluded time to pray. That's luxury, consider that luxury if you do have that time. But every day when you are at work, when you are even sitting and having a coffee with a friend, pray. This morning I was coming to church and an elderly gentleman was on the road uh, showing a lift for people. He wanted to go somewhere. And so I passed by sometime and I stopped. And I called out to him and I said, come here, where do you want to go? And he said, sir, I want to go to Rama Temple. That's just before our church here, Rama Temple. I want to go to Rama Temple. Can you drop me? I said, sure, get into the car. And so as he was getting into the car, he's, 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 he's chanting his Rama slogans. Like, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama. I'm saying, Hallelujah. I said, Jesus, how do I show your love to this elderly man? How do I show your love to this beautiful man who is so engrossed to know you, God? And God said, don't do anything. Show him love. Show him kindness this morning. I, I dropped him in the front of the Rama temple. He said, Sir, God bless you. Thank you so much. It's so hot, I could not walk. You see, sometimes we don't have to preach to people. We don't have to open the Bible to people. We don't have to say anything Jesus to people. We don't have to do that. But I was praying in my spirit and saying, Jesus, oh God, let this guy's chanting change from Rama to Jesus. Do you think God is so weak that he cannot minister to that guy without me raising my hand and praying for him? Do you think God is so weak? Do you think I help God to save people by me saying something that God saves them? God doesn't need me at all. God doesn't need anybody at all for that matter. But why are we there? Maybe the question then why are we there? We are there to listen to the voice of God and do the things he wants us to do and say the things he wants us to say. We don't do what we want to do. We don't say what we want to say. It was so tempting for me to say something Jesus oriented to that man. But the Lord said, Don't worry. I know him. I created him. Just be kind to him. Just draw him there. I prayed for him. I spiritually prayed for him. Maybe one day I will see him somewhere worshipping Jesus. I don't know. But I'm just saying, we have exercises to do in our spirits, not just with our voices. And that's what it means by saying, pray constantly. And then it goes on to say, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Sometimes I hear people saying, what is God's will for me, pastor? Here's one of it. 
give, give thanks to God in every situation because that's God's will for you. So one of God's will is you give thanks. Stop murmuring. Stop complaining. Start arguing. Stop cursing. Stop comparing. Stop saying I don't have a bike and my neighbor has a bike. Or oh, I have wanted a car and that guy has a car before me. And stop saying all these things. That hurts God. It's insulting. Don't ever do that. It says give thanks. Learn to give thanks. That's what it says. It says give thanks in everything. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And it goes on in verse 9 to say don't stifle the spirit. Or stifle the spirit however we, we pronounce that. It's basically saying don't quench the spirit. What is it to quench God's spirit? God's spirit is constantly trying to do something and influence us every second. Do you know something about God's spirit? We don't have to search for it. It searches us. We don't have to go searching for God's spirit. God's spirit searches for us and comes to us. We don't have to go after God's spirit. And that's why it says, don't quench it. Because it's always coming upon you. Don't quench it. We don't have to run after God's spirit. God's spirit runs after us. It is desperate to be part of us. It is desperate to be poured upon us. And that's what the Bible says. Don't quench it, man. Because it's always wanting to be part of you. Stop quenching the spirit of God. Part of quenching is also resisting. Sometimes when God's spirit works in us, we kind of resist for some ever, for whatever reason. One of the reasons of trying to resist or not inviting God's presence can be our backgrounds, can be our, our spiritual nature from our past, can be our religious upbringing. Maybe we were brought up Baptist or maybe Presbyterian or maybe Methodist or maybe Evangelical. Or it can be anything. And so maybe in our churches they didn't speak much about the Spirit of God. And so we think that is not part of us. That's not what I'm supposed to be. And so we tend to quench the Spirit of God unknowingly. I think God is very gracious and merciful to understand our status of why we quench the Spirit. But if we understand God is doing something and deliberately quench God's Spirit, we are going to lose a lot, not God. And it says, do not quench the Spirit of God. And it goes on to say, don't despise prophecies, but test all things. Don't despise prophecies. Sometimes I've seen people being very cynical about a prophecy. Very critical about a prophecy. I'm not saying that you should always take all prophecies and believe it. The next statement after that says, test everything it says. It says, don't despise it. But it also says, test it. So basically what it's saying is, don't believe everything just like that. You have work to do. Test it. It says, don't despise prophecies, but test all things. And it goes on to say, hold on to what is good. Hold on to what is good. Again, it's talking about holding on to something good. We need to pursue the good things in life. We need to pursue the good things in life. Sometimes I find people telling me, I can't be too spiritual. I'm not a very, very spiritual religious person. I'm not very close to God like you. Well, it's okay if you're not spiritual. It's okay if you're not close to God. The Bible's giving you one step lower. Can you be good? It's giving you an opportunity to become spiritual. Even if you think you're not spiritual, or if you consider spirituality a very high level, which is totally not the truth. God's saying, just be good. Pursue being good. Because when you are good, you become spiritual. Goodness is spirituality. Did you know why I said that? Because the devil doesn't do good things. The devil does bad things. So if you are doing good things, it means the Spirit of God is working in you. And if the Spirit of God is working in you, it means you're spiritual. You're a godly person. So you don't have to necessarily hold on the tag of being religious. But if you pursue good and hold on to what is good, you are spiritual. You have understood a spiritual perspective of the Kingdom of God, which is goodness. 
And that's why the Bible is making it easy for that. It says, pursue what is good. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. When we stay away from evil, it's easy for us to fall into the category of being good and doing good. And verse 22 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless. It is God's will that our spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and be kept blameless. How do we make our spirit, soul, and body be sound? And how can we make it be blameless? We pursue good. The Bible says, hold on to the good things. Stay away from evil. Pursue good. When you just do that, you will be able to keep your soul, body, and your mind sound and blameless. Because you're pursuing good things, it automatically gets in the category of that. It says, body be kept sound and blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. I want to end with something very simple. God who called you is faithful. And because he's faithful in his calling in your life, he will do it. You don't have to do it. Don't try to accomplish something in your life. When God has started something in your life, you don't have to end it. God starts it, God ends it. But if you started something in your life, you better end it. God will never end it for you. Let me make that clear again. If you start something in the flesh and in your mind and emotionally, if you start something humanly, you have to continue to do it and you have to end it. But if God started something for you, don't interfere with it. He will finish it. The problem is, we think we're doing God a favor. We think God needs our help. God does not need our help. He needs our cooperation. We are no spiritual, great, godly beings to give Him help. 